All the other ones are... Good evening and welcome to the College and Complexes. Good evening and welcome to the College and Complexes. My name is Tim. Charlie, can we have everybody? Good evening and welcome to the College of Complex. My name is Ken. I'll be serving as cameraman and possibly moderator tonight. We, tonight's speaker is uh, special May Day speakers from the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. There, here is the format of the College of Complexes. First, we'll have a brief announcements period, and our speakers will speak. Then there'll be a brief question and answer period. I mean, there'll be a question and answer period. And then we'll go to our rebuttal period. We have to be out of here by 8:45. Our speaker will get the last from the industries from the industrial workers of the world. <coughs> the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace as long so long as hunger and want are found among millions of the working people. And the few who make up the employing classes have all the good things in life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the mark workers of the world organizes the class, take possessions of the means of production, abolish the wage system, and live in harmony on it. Let's welcome Kelsey Walker to our illustrious College of Complexes stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wow. Is, is that good? Yeah. Um, my name is Kelsey Walker. I am the secretary for the Greater Chicago Industrial Workers of the World. Um, uh, please bear with me. Uh, I haven't used a PowerPoint in easily a decade, and um, I'm hoping I do it right. <laughs> um, so I... Uh, as was being uh, read to you just before I came up here, um, that's the preamble to the Industrial Workers of the World Constitution. Um, I wanted to read it in, the, in its entirety. It's not super long. Um, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among millions of the working people, and the few who make up the employing class have all the good things in them. <clears throat> The few who make up the employing class have all the work, have all the good things in life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organize as a class, take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system, and live in harmony with the earth. We find that the centering of the management of industries into fewer and fewer hands makes the trade unions unable to cope with the ever-growing power of the employing class. The trade unions foster a state of affairs which allows one set of workers to be pitted against another set of workers in the same industry, thereby helping defeat one another in wage wars. Moreover, the trade unions aid the employing class to mislead the workers into the belief that the working class have interests in common with the employers. These conditions can be changed and the interests of the working class upheld only by an organization formed in such a way that all its members in any one industry or in all industries, if necessary, cease work whenever a strike or lockout is on in any department thereof, thus making an injury to one, an injury to all. Instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, we must inscribe upon our banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wage system. It is the historic mission of the working class to do away with capitalism. The army of production must be organized, not only for everyday struggle with capitalists, but also to carry on production when capitalism shall have been overthrown. By organizing industrially, we are forming the structure of the new society within the shell of the old. So in addition to talking about the IWW today, um, I wanted to talk about uh, May Day in general. So the origins of May Day. And I wanted to read a, a, a little thing from uh, Eric Chase, uh, written in 1993, um, about the origins of May Day, because he said it way better than I could figure out how to say. Um, as early as the 1860s, workers agitated to shorten their 10 to 16 hour working days to eight hour days without a cut in pay. 
by the 1880s, organized labor had increased in strength enough for workers really to start demanding the eight-hour workday of their employers. At this time, socialism was a new and attractive idea to working people, many of whom were drawn to its ideology of working class control over the production and distribution of all goods and services. Workers had seen firsthand that capitalism benefited only their bosses, trading workers' lives for profit. Thousands of men, women, and children were dying needlessly every year in the workplace, with life expectancy as low as their early 20s in some industries, and little hope but death of rising out of their destitution. Socialism provided another option. A variety of socialist organizations sprung out, sprung up throughout the later half of the 19th century, ranging from political parties to choir groups. In fact, many socialists were elected into governmental office by their constituency. But again, many of these socialists were hamstrung by the political process, which was so evidently controlled by big, big business and the bipartisan political machine. Tens of thousands of socialists broke ranks from their parties, rebuffed the entire political process, which was seen as nothing more than protection for the wealthy, and created anarchist groups throughout the country. Literally thousands of working people embraced the ideals, the ideals of anarchism, which sought to put an end to all hierarchical structures, including government, emphasized worker-controlled industry, and valued direct action over the bureaucratic uh, political process. It's inaccurate to say that labor unions were taken over by anarchists and socialists, but rather anarchists and socialists made up the labor unions. At its national convention in Chicago in 1884, the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions, uh, which later became the American Federation of Labor, proclaimed that eight hours shall constitute a legal day's labor from and after May 1st, 1886. The following year, the FOTLU, backed by many Knights of Labor locals, reiterated their proclamation stating that it would be supported by strikes and demonstrations. At first, most radicals and anarchists regarded this demand as too reformist, failing to strike at the root of evil. A year before the Haymarket Massacre, Samuel Fieden, or Fielden pointed out in the anarchist newspaper, The Alarm, that whether a man works eight hours a day or 10 hours a day, he's still a slave. Despite the misgivings of many of the anarchists, an estimated quarter million workers in the Chicago area became directly involved in the crusade to implement the eight-hour workday, <coughs> including the Trades and Labor Assembly, the Socialist Labor Party, uh, and local Knights of Labor. As more and more of the workforce mobilized against the employers, these radicals conceded to fight for the eight-hour day, realizing that the tide of opinion and determination of most wage workers was set in this direction. With the involvement of the anarchists, there seemed to be an infusion of greater issues than the eight-hour day. There grew a sense of greater social revolution beyond the more immediate gains of shortened hours, but a drastic change in the economic structure of capitalism. In a proclamation printed just before May 1st, 1886, one publisher appealed to working people with this plea, working men to arms, war to the palace, peace to the cottage, and death to luxurious idleness. The wage system is the only cause of the world's misery. It is supported by the rich classes, and to destroy it, they must, they must be either made to work or die. One pound of dynamite is better than a bushel of ballots. Make your demand for eight hours, with weapons in your hands to meet the capitalistic bloodhounds, police, and militia in proper manner. Not surprisingly, the entire city was prepared for mass bloodshed, reminiscent of the railroad strike a decade earlier when police and soldiers gunned down hundreds of striking workers. On May 1st, oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> on uh, May 1st, 1886, more than 300,000 workers in 13,000 businesses across the United States walked off their jobs in the first May Day celebration in history. In Chicago, the epicenter for the eight-hour day agitators, 40,000 went out on strike with the anarchists in the forefront of the public's eye. With their fiery speeches and revolutionary ideology of direct action, anarchists and anarchism became respected and embraced by the working people and despised by the capitalists. The names of many 
Albert Parsons, jo Johan Musk, August Spies, and Louis Ling became household words in Chicago and throughout the country. Parades, bands and, th bands and tens of thousands of demonstrators in the streets exemplified the workers' strength and unity, yet didn't become violent as the newspapers and authorities had predicted. <laughs> Sorry, like I said, not used to using a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, more and more workers continue to walk off their jobs until the numbers swelled to nearly 100,000, yet peace prevailed. It was not until two days later, May 3rd, 1886, that violence broke out at the McCormick Reaper Works between police and strikers. For six months, armed Pinkerton agents and the police harassed and beat locked out steel workers as they picketed. Most of these workers belonged to the anarchist-dominated metal workers union. During a speech near the McCormick plant, some 200 demonstrators joined the steel workers on the picket line. Beatings with police clubs escalated into rock throwing by the strikers, which the police responded to with gunfire. At least two strikers were killed and an unknown number were wounded. Full of rage, a public meeting was called by some of the anarchists for the following day in Haymarket Square to discuss the police brutality. Due to bad weather and short notice, only about 3,000 of the tens of thousands of people showed up from the day before. This affair included families with children and the mayor of Chicago himself. Later, the mayor would testify that the crowd remained calm and orderly, and that Speaker August Spice made no suggestion for immediate use of force or violence toward any person. As the speech wound down, two detectives rushed to the main body of police, resort reporting that a speaker was using inflammatory language, inciting the police to march on the speaker's wagon. As the police began to disperse the already thinning crowd, a bomb was thrown into the police ranks. No one knows who threw the bomb, but speculations varied from blaming any one of the anarchists to an agent provocateur working for the police. Enraged, the police fired into the crowd. The, in, the exact number of civilians killed or wounded was never determined, but an estimated seven or eight civilians died, and up to 40 were wounded. One officer died immediately, and another seven died in the following weeks. Later evidence indicated that only one of the police deaths could be attributed to the bomb and that all the other police fatalities had or could have been due to their own indiscriminate gunfire. Aside from the bomb thrower, who was never identified, it was the police, not the anarchists, who perpetrated the violence. Eight anarchists, Albert Parsons, August Spies, Samuel Fielden, Oscar Neeb, Michael Schwab. Neeby. Thank you. You're welcome. George Engel, Adolf Fisher, and Louis Ling were arrested and convicted of murder, though only three were even present at the market. And those three were in full view of all when the bombing occurred. The jury in their trial was comprised of business leaders and a gross mockery of justice similar to the Sacco Vanzetti case 30 years later, or the trials of AIM and Black Panther members in the 70s. The entire world watched as these eight organizers were convicted, not for their actions, of which all were innocent, but their political and social beliefs. On November 11, 1887, after many failed appeals, Parsons, Spies, Engel, and Fisher were hung to death. Louis Ling, in his final protest of the state's claim of authority and punishment, took his own life the night before with an explosive device in his mouth. The remaining organizers, Fielden, Neeby, and Schwab, were pardoned six years later by Governor Altgeld who publicly lambasted the judge on the travesty of justice. Immediately after the Haymarket Massacre, big business and government concluded that what some say was the very first red scare in this country. Spun by mainstream media, anarchism became synonymous with bomb throwing and socialism became un-American. The common image of a bomb throwing and, or, of an anarchist became a bearded Eastern European immigrant with a bomb in one hand and a dagger in the other. Today we see tens of thousands of activists embracing the ideals of the Haymarket Martyrs and those who established May Day as an International Workers' Day. Um. 
Ironically, May Day is an official holiday in 66 countries and unofficially celebrated in many more, but rarely is it recognized in this country where it began. So, words stronger than any I could write are engraved on the Haymarket Monument. The day will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices who are throttling today. Truly, history has a lot to teach us about the roots of our radicalism. When we remember that people were shot so that we could have the eight-hour day. If we acknowledge that homes with families in them were burned to the ground so that we could have Saturday as part of the weekend. When we recall eight-year-old victims of industrial accidents who marched in the streets protesting working conditions and child labor only to be beat down by the police and company thugs. We understand that our current condition cannot be taken for granted. People fought for the rights and dignities we enjoy today and there's still a lot more to fight for. This is why we celebrate May Day. So, I think, uh, so the Haymarket, Haymar or the Haymarket Martyrs Memorial. Uh, so, that brings me to the origins of the IWW. So, the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, was founded in 1905 here in Chicago. Um, there was a convention of about 200 socialist anarchists and Marxists, um, mostly members of the Socialist Party of America and the Socialist Labor Party. Um, radical trade unionists from all over the United States, uh, mainly the Western Federation of Miners, um, who strongly opposed the policies of the American Federation of Labor. Um, they gathered here for what was uh, known as the industrial, uh, the industrial Congress or the Industrial Union Convention. Um, later, now, it's known as the first annual convention of the IWW. Um, sorry, I need to click. I'll, I'll get it for you. Um, yeah. So, uh, sorry, where was I? Um, okay, so the first, uh, the first annual convention of the IWW. Um, a tie-in, one of the main ties, tie-ins between May Day and this first, uh, this first Congress of the IWW was that uh, many of the many of the people who were involved in those May Day demonstrations were part of this Congress, uh, including uh, Lucy Parsons, the widow of uh, Albert Parsons. Um, she was a longtime radical. She was a labor agitator and an organizer. Um, she, along with uh, Big Bill Haywood, uh, James Connolly, Daniel DeLeon, uh, Eugene Dubs, uh, Thomas Haggerty, uh, Mary Harris, uh, better known as uh, Mother Jones, uh, and a whole slew of others. Uh, they came together to, they came together in opposition of the American Federation of Labor's acceptance of capitalism and its refusal to include unskilled workers and craft unions. Uh, they drew a line instead of instead of drawing a line between gender and race or uh, between what you did for a living. They drew the line between class. There was the employing class and there was the working class. Um, the IWW aimed to promote worker solidarity in the revolutionary struggle to overthrow the employing class. Their motto was an injury to one is an injury to all, uh, which improved upon the Knights of Labor's creed, an injury to one is the concern of all, which was, which was at its most popular in the 1880s. In particular, the IWW was organized because of the belief among many unionists, socialists, anarchists, Marxists, and radicals that the AFL had not only failed to effectively organize the working class, but it was causing separation rather than unity within groups of workers by organizing according to narrow craft principles. The Wobblies believe that all workers should organize as a class. The Wobblies differ from 
from other union movements of the time by promotion of industrial unionism as opposed to the craft union. <laughs> as opposed to the craft unionism of the American Federation of Labor. The IWW emphasized rank and file organization as opposed to empowering leaders who would bargain with employers on behalf of workers. The early IWW chapters consistently refused to sign contracts, which they believed would restrict workers' abilities to aid each other when called upon. Though never developed in any detail, Wobblies envisioned the general strike is the means by which the wage system would be overthrown and a new economic system ushered in, one which emphasized people over profit, cooperation over competition. One of the IWW's most important contributions to the labor movement and broader push towards social justice was that when founded, it was the only American union to welcome all workers, including women, immigrants, African Americans, and Asians into the same organization. Many of its early members were immigrants, and some, such as uh, Carlo Tresca, Joe Hill, and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, rose to prominence in the leadership. <sighs> Finns formed a sizable portion <coughs> of the immigrant IWW membership. Uh, conceivably, the number of Finns belonging to the IWW was somewhere between five and 10,000. The Boys Finnish line- take another drink of water. Thank you. I've been losing my voice for a while. I teach. Just, just, just feel free. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Sorry, where was I? Um, an injury to one is an injury to all. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very gallant It was very appreciated. Um, so I was talking about the. Okay. I see where I was. Uh, so the Finnish language newspaper of the IWW, uh, which I can't pronounce, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I think it's pronounced Industrialisti, uh, published in its <clears throat> published in Duluth, Minnesota, a center of the mining industry, was the union's only daily paper. Uh, at its peak, it ran 10,000 copies per issue. Another Finnish language wobbly publication. Um, was the monthly uh, Road to Freedom. Uh, sorry. I'm not used to speaking for this long about any one thing. Just keep going. <laughs> I'm doing fine. Take your time. Thank Take your you. Time. <laughs> One example of the union's commitment to equality was Local 8, a longshoreman's branch in Philadelphia, one of the largest ports in the, in the nation in the World War I era. Uh, led by Ben Fletcher, an African American, Local 8 had more than 5,000 members, the majority of whom were African American, um, along with uh, more than 1,000 immigrants, primarily Lithuanians and Poles, Irish Americans, and uh, numerous white, white ethnicities. Uh, currently, I think, there? Oh. Uh, currently, in uh, North America, the IWW has a membership of around 4,000. Uh, nearly 100 Wobblies in uh, the Chicagoland area exist, exist now. Sorry? How many now? Uh, about, uh, about 100 in the Chicagoland area. Um, about 4,000 right now in the United States. Uh, there are more in uh, uh, spread throughout Europe, uh, Australia, Canada. Um, right now, uh, the Greater Chicago IWW branch has about half of the, uh, the Wobblies in the Greater Chicagoland area. Um, 
those other ones just <coughs> remain independent. Uh, these numbers also don't include uh, those who are inactive, uh, don't currently pay dues, uh, had been members previously but left for whatever reason, um, or those who are involved in our uh, General Defense uh, Committee, which has uh, less strict rules than we do about uh, who can be a member. Um, the General Defense Committee uh, helps take care of us, uh, helps provide us with legal defense, um, helps boost our numbers on picket lines. Um, we, uh, the Greater Chicago IWW, we were chartered in uh, 2016, um, so only about three years ago. Um, we had had a brief hiatus. Uh, we had been, at one point, the oldest of uh, branches of the IWW as we were founded here. Um, we do, we do currently boast an ever-growing and highly active membership. Um, our membership is made up mostly of women and people of color at this point, um, covering a very wide socioeconomic uh, spectrum. Uh, we have people who are currently unemployed, people who are retired, um, all the way up to people who are um, engineers, uh, computer programmers, um, librarians. Um, we as a branch, I feel, uh, very much epitomize our banner slogan of one big union. Uh, Um, along with the rich history that has influenced the shape of labor today, the IWW continues to fight with, for, and as the working class. To quote our website, the IWW is a member-run union for all workers, a union dedicated to organizing on the job, in our industries, and in our communities. IWW members are organizing to win better conditions today and build a world with economic democracy tomorrow. We want our workplaces run for the benefit of workers and communities rather than for a handful of bosses and executives. Some of our current organizing campaigns uh, nationwide uh, include the Burgerville uh, Workers Union in Oregon and Washington. Um, Burgerville is a restaurant chain, a uh, fast food restaurant chain in uh, the Pacific Northwest, primarily in Oregon and Washington. Uh, they offer locally and responsibly sourced healthier uh, burger joint fare. Um, they began their organizing efforts in 2014 and went public in 2016. Um, they have, they've managed to uh, get the local support of other unions in their area, uh, the SEIU, uh, Portland, Association, Portland Association of Teachers, uh, the Oregon Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals, uh, among others. They've staged uh, successful strikes, pickets. Um, they've managed to win a few things and it was pretty exciting because um, they are the first uh, the first American fast food uh, union so it was it was really a big deal for them to be able to actually accomplish something and really come together um, in June 2017 uh, Burgerville ended up having to pay a settlement of $10,000 um, after an investigation by the Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries, finding that the company had violated state mandated break periods for workers. Um, that was one of their, their union pain points at the time, and so it was, it was really a big win for them. Um, in uh, last year, about this time in April and May, uh, they won two NLRB elections uh, for two of their locations. Uh, so they are a, a federally recognized union. 
Uh, a newer one, it, also in the Pacific Northwest, uh, is the Little Big Burger Union, uh, known as the Little uh, the Little Big Union. Um, they, uh, similar to Burgerville, uh, are a fast food uh, fast food restaurant uh, fast food restaurant union. Um, they've been uh, also receiving a lot of publicity and uh, notice from. Uh, both their local papers and news stations, and uh, even NPR has covered them. Uh, more locally, uh, we have uh, a chain of grocery stores, uh, the Dill Pickle Food Co-op. Um, we won our NLRB certification in uh, March of 2017. Um, it's been kind of a difficult uh, organizing campaign um, but with the help of the NLRB, we've actually made some serious progress again. Uh, many of the goal, or a few of the goals that they have uh, include worker safety training, um, increasing the member numbers, uh, having a formal grievance procedure. Uh, they're not asking for things that are extravagant or huge they really just want to be uh, recognized for what they do for their company and make sure that their their working conditions are safe and solid and that they have uh, they have someone to turn to when things are not good uh, Mobile Rail Solutions is another local organizing campaign. That one's been going on for a very long time, six years now. Uh, they won their NLRB certification in 2013. Um, <clears throat> <Sorry>. <laughs> They began organizing uh, with the demand that they be treated with respect, uh, given wages equivalent to other union workers doing the same job. Uh, they wanted safe vehicles to drive and some basic dignity. Uh, they spent years fighting with their bosses for a contract. Um, to this date, they still don't have their contract. They've been to the table a number of times, and uh, it has not worked out. Uh, we're still working on that. Um, they've dealt with illegal firings, uh, bad faith negotiating. Um, they've dealt with all manner of anti-union sentiment from their bosses, and uh, but they keep fighting the good fight. So that's a that's positive. Um, in New York, uh, in New York City, there's uh, the Stardust Family United uh, Workers Union. Um, they organized in 2016 uh, in Manhattan at uh, Ellen Stardust Diner. Um, they began organizing because uh, 30 employees were fired all at one time, um, as well as an unpopular new scheduling system. They, uh, many of the workers there are also uh, uh, performers, and uh, part of why they worked there uh, was because their scheduling system allowed them to be performers still. And uh, they made that rigid enough that people couldn't do the other things that they were there to do. Um, after they went public, uh, the union accused Stardust Management of retaliatory uh, firings and uh, posting anti-union materials in the restaurant. Um, when they went public, uh, they had 50 employees uh, in their union. Uh, in 2016, in response to a rash of firings, harassment of employees, and policy changes that coincided with the new management team, 
uh, they they went they went ahead and went public with their union. Um, they have had to deal with firings uh, based entirely upon their union activity, uh, even though that is terribly illegal. Uh, the union had uh, has stepped in, uh, provided financial relief, and paid for legal fees. Uh, eventually, the owners of uh, the owners of Ellen's Stardust Diner. Um, they offered all 31 fired employees uh, their jobs back and back pay as compensation. Uh, only 13 of those employees chose to go back to work there after that. Um, they've used all manner of tactics in their organizing. Uh, they filed lawsuits. Uh, they filed unfair labor practices with the NLRB. Uh, they used shift strikes and collective refusal to, prefer, to perform uncompensated work. Uh, they blockaded delivery trucks at the restaurant and marched on the management demanding uh, reinstatement of tip buckets, uh, which accounted for about a third of their pay. Um, they had picket lines and demonstrations outside of their building. Uh, and it's been successful for the most part. So a fun part of the a fun part of the union that I wanted to uh, bring up also is our junior wobblies, um, of which I have one sitting in the back back there. Uh, my ten year old son who uh, participates in uh, organizing activity with us. Um, we are in our effort to truly be uh, one big union. We recognize that our union members have families. Um, we want them to be part of the union, and part of that is including the kids. Um, most of our branches in the United States have uh, some form of a Junior Wobblies uh, committee. Um, they provide childcare during our meetings, um, or where our, uh, when we're dealing with other forms of organizing or having trainings. Um, they, uh, they organize play dates and get-togethers for the kids. Um, we have uh, an annual Junior Wobbly summer camp, even. Uh, this year it's being held in Wisconsin. Uh, it's, a, it's a sleepaway camp, a multi-day sleepaway camp for our, uh, our union families and their kids uh, so that they can spend time together. And, uh, you know, swim and canoe and uh, uh, participate in things that help uh, help build the union sentiment uh, amongst the kids. Uh, one of our recent themes was uh, an organize your school uh, situation where our junior wobblies participated in workshops and role plays and uh, uh, practiced organizing their own student unions at camp. Uh, so, uh, within the branch, uh, one of our one of our main committees, uh, in addition to uh, organizing labor, um, is our education and outreach committee. Um, they conduct our trainings. Uh, one of which was going on this weekend. I came here directly from a, day, a full full day of training. Um, we have educa uh, educational and entertainment events. Uh, we try to promote the membership, uh, promote to the membership uh, outside trainings as well, uh, educational educational events such as uh, the College of Complexes. Um, we gather and distribute uh, literature and swag uh, such as our table in the back. Um, and we plan our May Day events. Uh, our training that we're having this weekend currently is our uh, Organizer Training 101. Um, we put that on with help from our National Organizer Training Committee. Uh, there are two-day classes um, that we provide to the membership at minimal cost, uh, often free. 
uh, so that we can we can make sure that our membership is really solid in how to utilize organizing tactics and what kind of strategies are at their disposal for uh, for organizing their workplace. Um, we conduct uh, picket trainings and marshalling trainings. Um, we have plans to have uh, parliamentary procedure trainings for our meetings so that any, uh, any car uh, card carrying wobbly has the ability to fully participate in the democratic nature of our union. Um, we currently have defensive Chinese boxing classes. We are working on uh, having food distribution and uh, pantry for our workers because we believe that hungry people make poor revolutionaries and poor organizers. Um, so we make, a, we make a pretty big effort to make sure that people are fed and taken care of. Um, we're, we've been working on uh, developing trainings for, uh, on topics like labor law, uh, workers' rights, um, as well as uh, workshops, including uh, sharing each other's skill sets, because we all have different skills and abilities that would be beneficial to each other. Um, we have a book lending library. Uh, we have a, uh, a full library of uh, resources of all kinds for our membership. And uh, we're constantly trying to promote uh, other uh, other uh, labor organizing uh, educational opportunities. Um, we really do try to in enforce and encourage uh, a, a sense of camaraderie in the union because we are really all in this for each other. Uh, so, which brings me to uh, my, my, final, my final bit, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing for May Day this year and what we've done before. Um, previous, uh, previously, near the beginning, one of the slides, I, I kind of wish that I had at the end here, I had a picture from our uh, May Day March last year where we had um, We'd encourage all of our workers, instead of wearing things that declare us as being part of the IWW or being uh, radicals in some way, we really encourage everyone to wear their work clothes so that onlookers would have a better sense that we are not other. We are, we are you. We are all workers. Um, we had our picket signs uh, that declared uh, what our occupations are and that we believe in one big union. Uh, the picture from earlier had uh, my son with his, uh, with his sign that said, I am a student and I believe in one big union. I was very proud. Uh, this year, uh, we've joined with uh, the University of Chicago Labor Coalition in Hyde Park. Um, from our press release, uh, the UC Chicago Labor Coalition will be conducting a demonstration consisting of a march and rally on May 1st, uh, International Workers' Day, beginning at 11.30 on the corner of 59th and Ellis. The UC Labor, uh, UC Chicago uh, <coughs> Labor Coalition has chosen to demonstrate on this date in commemoration of the Haymarket Square General Strike of May 1886, where workers demanded the eight-hour workday, just as those workers took to the streets en masse in protest of unfair treatment by their employers, so shall the workers of UC Chicago Labor Coalition, local community members, and others standing in solidarity, as an injury to one is an injury to all. Uh, we'll be marching in, uh, marching for worker and community power and inclusion in local development administrative accountability, and good faith bargaining and cooperation with workers, whether unionized or not. Uh, the coalition is comprised of janitors, nurses, teachers, grad workers, adjuncts, engineers, secretaries, CNAs, and other UC workers from unions and labor organizations, including Chicago Jobs with Justice, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Okay, give me a minute. Uh, National Nurses United, uh, Floods Call, 
Service Employees International Union, Graduate Students United, uh, the Greater Chicago Industrial Workers of the World, Southside Together Organizing for Power, Tenants United, uh, the Teamsters, and uh, the Bakery Confectionery Tobacco Workers and Grain Millers Union, uh, unionized under the AFL-CIO. Um, over this weekend, we're conducting a, a training, like I said. Uh, we're tabling tomorrow at the Forest Home Historical Society's May Day celebration, uh, speaking here, and holding a concert tonight. Uh, actually, it just started, I think, um, benefiting our strike fund. Uh, and so we, we have a, we take May Day very seriously. <laughs> Um, on May Day, uh, in the morning, we'll be laying roses uh, at the memorial at uh, Forest Home Cemetery at, at the grave sites of the Haymarket Martyrs and the founders of the IWW who are buried there. And uh, all of the other anarchists and syndicalists that are uh, buried in uh, uh, that specific area. Uh, what is it they call it? Happiness Plot. <laughs> I think there's also like a radical row or something like that. It's, 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 it's called a communist plot. Oh, yeah. Plots. Oh. Is, it, is that also the Waldheim Cemetery? Yes, uh -huh. it is the same place. Uh, they renamed it a few years ago, I think. But it's the same place. Um, so, I. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll plug it. We are accepting donations for uh, for the flowers. Uh, we we end up buying hundreds of roses to lay all over the place, and they're uh, all are welcome to join us and uh, put the roses where they feel where they feel uh, especially. Uh, Please uh, don't. Where they feel especially good about. Uh, I. Then we'll be marching with uh, we'll be marching with the UCI uh, Labor Coalition, um, and then we have uh, another benefit concert that night for our strike fund uh, at Burlington Bar. If anyone wants to join us uh, to close the day, um, if anyone is uh, is interested in joining us, um, we have uh, all of the information uh, included on our Facebook page, or you can always email us. Um, that is, oops, I hit the wrong button. Yeah, that is what I have. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you stay up there and take questions, yes. I'd like to ask one first. Can you give us a little bit about your background and why you got involved with this? Me personally? Yes, if you don't um, mind. Sure. Uh, I had I I grew up in uh, in uh, the South Burbs of uh, of Chicago, so Southern Cook County. Um, I grew up knowing uh, about unions. Um, I think we read The Jungle when I was uh, when I was in like seventh grade, something like that, and I got really into it, uh, into the concept of labor organizing when I was that young like barely older than my son is now. And um, when I was a teenager, I got a little bit more involved in uh, radical politics. I did a lot more reading. I was a history buff. Um, when I was uh, 21, I moved to Alaska and I got involved in a National Labor Federation uh, uh, entity there. and. Our big thing was to provide services to those who were without a union. Um, so people that, that couldn't typically be unionized. We didn't have the IWW in Anchorage at that time. I think we still don't in Anchorage. Um, so I went with what was available. And we provided food and legal assistance and education um, to all of these uh, uh, all of these workers that didn't know what they were really entitled to and whose voices were suppressed on the job. Um, 
after that, I moved, when I was in my uh, mid-20s, I moved uh, to Portland, Oregon, and I got involved with the IWW there. I got involved with those Wobblies, and uh, it just seemed like a natural continuation. Um, I made an effort to organize uh, uh, my workplace along with uh, some other workplaces. Uh, I was a bartender, and bartenders don't have a union. So I, I got involved, started trying to uh, organize. It failed um, because bartenders are also afraid of unions, I found out. And, uh, and then I moved back to Chicago and got involved here. And it's, uh, it's become a very big part of my life. Okay. Uh, Andy, can you moderate or somebody moderate for questions? Unless you want to pick somebody you want. I'll be there in two minutes. All right, who's the next question? Next Mommy. question. Well, it's like a speaker. Right? No. Let's thank her. Well, let's thank our speaker again, real quick. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, go ahead. So, if the, the union is supposed to be the union, right? Yeah. They're both wobblies. Yes. And and they wanted to support the hamburger shop strike. Say the hamburger hamburger people were going on strike. That would be illegal, would it not, for the for the uh, railroad workers to go to the pickup lines and pick it with the hamburger workers people. I think that's illegal that? under Taft Hartley. I believe that that is true. Um, I'm not sure how else to respond to that, but I, I mean, I, be, I believe that that is true, that uh, that wouldn't necessarily be uh, legal. I believe that that's the secondary striking, something like that. Charlie? Um, Charlie! Yeah. Do you know about that, Charlie? Is that illegal? Is it illegal for a, a union to strike in sympathy with another union? Charlie. Uh, no. Basically, no. It's not illegal. Charlie says no, and he. I like that answer. Next, you know, <laughs> Charlie, next question. Oh, what's the answer to the question? <laughs> it's not illegal. Charlie says it's not. Yes, it, is it, is. Um, it is illegal. Yeah. Illegal. It is but, illegal. Upon so further consideration, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes. are, are you involved at all in any of the teacher like union strikes? I uh, we have I. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, members who have uh, attended. We have dual card members yeah, I, yeah, card who yeah. have participated. Um, <coughs> I, our, I can only really speak to our particular branch. Uh, we have not uh, I officially, in an official capacity, gone out and participated. But I, I know that we have members who have uh, individually participated. Over here. Why are there so many failed so socialist states like Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia? All these states are failed socialist states. Not to mention uh, Russia and uh, China. Okay. That sounds like something that would take a. a much more political science background than I have <laughs> to be able okay. to answer well. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Besides, yes. I think they failed. <laughs> they um, did. I was interested in why you said the bartenders are afraid of um, striking. What do you do? Do you give training? Is there a way to help them get over their fears of organizing? We do. Um, we do have a number of uh, trainings and um, classes and tactics. Uh, personally, I believe that uh, my, my organizing effort, if I had been able to devote more time to it, um, I was in the process of moving back here to Chicago when I was uh, trying to organize the bartenders. Um, I believe that if I had, if I had uh, stayed there and put in enough time before I moved that we could have worked past that. But um, restaurant work is so uh, tenuous, I guess. It's 
you know that there are plenty of people out there that could come in and take your job, and so it, it makes it very scary to to walk. Um, even though uh, you know uh, restaurant and bar work is uh, does take some level of uh, special skill and special training, there are lots of that. That market is very saturated, so it's it's scary. Sir. Um. Over a hundred years ago, the Wobblies were huge, and now you've got a hundred members. So, what's that all about? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, actually, uh, there was that. There was, uh, you know, there was a lot of red scare. Um, it, it kind of fell apart for a long time. Uh, over the last decade or so, we've actually been growing in numbers by leaps and bounds. Like. Uh, we recently uh, charted our growth over the past, uh, I think, just five years, and it was a very steep uptick after it being kind of, uh, kind of just solid for a while. So, we're, I think we're doing better. Charlie? Yeah, Kelsey, if you got a job and you listen to the boss and do whatever he tells you to do, you'll get ahead, right? Um, should you repeat because that? Charlie, repeat it. You've some trouble like this, right? Re repeat your ch question, question, Charlie. <laughs> I want to get this for the record. Like Andy, move your head back so we can get Charlie on record. We can't hear you, Charlie. Oh, uh, if you uh, do what the boss tells you to do, isn't that how you get ahead? Instead of, like, talking back to him, like, these wobblies are encouraging you to do, you know? Like you've never talked back to anybody. <laughs> right, Charlie. <laughs> Your sarcasm is appreciated. <laughs> um, you know, I think that I, I don't think that strikes are going to be able to really disrupt the economic system <clears throat> as long as you can only strike in these little teeny pockets and. Uh, the Wobblies stopped that by having one big union so that when it was time to go on strike, everybody went on strike and that really disrupted the system and made a difference. And that's the reason that there's only a hundred Wobblies in Illinois right now because... Question, you please. You can't, uh, I mean, you can't just say we're going on question? strike. What's the question? Well, the question is about, uh, the, it's an overall question about what you, what can you do about Taft-Hartley to um, make one big union effective? Well, what, is, what exactly is Taft-Hartley law? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Know, Address the what is Taft Hartley first. Okay. Speak it to the I I'm trying I'm I'm trying to think how to how to answer that question. Okay. Um, okay, Taft Hartley is a federal law that regulates what unions can can or can't do. And they can't work with other unions. That's one well, of the aspects. Charlie, anything to add to it? It first was the Wagner Act passed in thirty five, which established unions. Then after the war, they came into Taft Hartley, which was to check, put a check on unions, and uh, employers could file charges against unions, uh, and unions could be guilty of this. It got into such things as the laws of picketing and strikes, common sight as picketing, meaning like if one employer at a place is on strike, everyone, you know, is, is in strike in common. They outlawed things. Primary and secondary boycotts were outlawed. So it was a check on the unions as Republican legislation. Okay, now the question is, uh, how, do, how does the IWW work with Taft Hartley? I can answer that. Okay. They actually, one of the reasons that kind of got Taft Hartley, or killed, that didn't help the union strike, was that they would not comply with any of these, the terms of Taft Hartley, which they just did not agree to. So that's why they, they're not, that's all. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would not go along with death the rules of Taft Next question. Um, it's two questions, but number one is some people were protesting uh, the Lincoln Yard tips in Chicago. Were, were the Wobblies there? Or did the Wobblies have a stand on the Lincoln Yard? I, I, I'm not sure. I can totally hear. I'm sorry. Some people were protesting the Lincoln Yard TIF, Tax Increment Financing District. Did they strike that? They probably wouldn't. Did, 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 did the Wobblies have a position about TIF? Um, I don't believe that we have an official, uh, an official position. <laughs> okay. Next question. You had two? No, but, uh, the yeah, three yeah. Right here. Are white men the new discriminated uh, uh, minority? I'm sorry? White men the new discriminated minority? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's horrible. Horrible. Uh, yeah. horrible. Yeah, horrible. Are we? Uh, are are uh, white men the new uh, uh, discriminated, discriminated minority? Discriminated minority. Yeah. Do you want to no, take that? Uh, <laughs> I'm with him. You know, it might not have much to do with the IW. <laughs> well, Any other questions? Sure it's all okay. I think you got your answer there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going once. I was going to ask, yeah, how do you plan to grow in 10 years? You know, are you doing outreach? It does seem kind of small. Uh, we have been doing a lot of outreach. Um, like I said, we only rechartered uh, three years ago. and. You know, I, the Chicagoland area has uh, 100 wobblies. Um, I mean, some of those people were wobblies on their own, um, but that that number is uh, has kind of been jumping pretty rapidly recently. What does it take to be a wobbly? You said there's membership requirements. Um, um, well, our basic okay. membership requirement is that you cannot be uh, an employer. Um, whoa, what was that? the back the part of the uh, oh it jumped at me um uh, it's just uh, uh you can't be an employer uh we don't accept people who have the ability the to hire and fire um we i uh, don't uh organize police and we do not organize uh prison guards but those are our those are our only requirements we organize homemakers even and retired people and people who are uh students or uh looking for work you know so why do they call it wobbly that one i'm not entirely sure there's a bunch of different theories on where that came from um but there, there's no definitive answer to that chinese guy out in northwest okay are there yeah. others really yeah they represented lumberjacks uh, one of the stories is the chinese any other questions all right. If not, we'll go to rebuttals. If not, we'll go to. Let's thank our here. speaker again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. No, you did good. Thank you, Ed. You did good. Thank you for showing up tonight. Thank you. One more round of applause. Come on, guys. Thank you. Our rebu infamous rebuttal period. Okay, uh, who's, who's got gonna, the timer? Who's gonna do a, what do you call it? A rebuttal? Yes, why not? Counting, counting rebuttals? First. We'll no. go up. How many rebuttals? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How much time do we have? We have Let's, we'll go five minutes each. Yeah, five minutes. Five I think minutes we got each. enough time. Um, somebody want to keep time? Andy, can timer? you keep time? Yeah, I'll keep time. Okay. Five minutes. Yeah, I like this guy. Uh, this is from the new Baffler. Uh, the very first article. Uh, the new Baffler is about uh, growing uh, growing up as a teenager in the United States, and um, I just love that question about are white men the new uh, discriminated. Um, uh, Class. class, or what do you want to say? So, um, I don't know how I can introduce this because I'm not going to be able to. Um, he's he's talking about an article that he re uh, wrote, read, and uh, the article talks about how um, 
American culture protects young teenage or protects adolescent boys. And the ultimate aim of this protecting our boys rhetoric became clear at Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Christine Blasey Ford testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee that Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her while they were both in high school, he at the prestigious all-male Catholic George school Georgetown Prep, she at a nearby all-female prep school, triggering a wide-ranging investigation of what turned out to be a remarkably debauched 1980s adolescence. We saw how Kavanaugh's friends had bragged in their high school yearbooks, using code words for quaaludes and Bacardi 151 cocktails at Beach Week, a tradition of unsupervised teenage partying that surely seemed bizarre to people raised in America's relatively puritanical middle class. It is perfectly normal for American adolescents and young adults to experiment with drugs, alcohol, and casual sex. It's also true that the boozing, groping, and worse at these elite schools, elite schools seems to have been institutional, tacitly condoned by any ostensible authority figures with the power to rein it in. So the people with the power to rein it in ignored it and accepted it. Everything we learned about Kavanaugh's high school days, the drinking, the apparently common date rape at packed house parties, the routine sexual humiliation of women happened under the noses, but not under the direct supervision of these authority figures. This arrangement was plainly designed in part to give the members of the adult world plausible deniability, but also to preserve the fiction that the elite institutions they entrusted their children to were shaping future leaders, future leaders of great moral character. When the mask was torn off, the response of Kavanaugh and his defenders was not embarrassment or shame, but instead a hysterical and rabid defense of Kavanaugh and the social settings that produced him. Some old pre playbook might well have had Kavanaugh playing at con contrition, saying he'd matured and promising to make amends. But the new strategy, borrowed from the boss himself, was not to give an inch, not to let the bastards get away with trying to stop a good American boy from getting away with something. So Kavanaugh threw a snarling, angry, self-pitying tantrum and lied about obvious things like the crude and demeaning sexual jokes in his yearbook and his own youthful penchant for drinking to the point of blacking out, repeating ridiculous lies in an increasingly aggrieved fashion, knowing you were lying, knowing everyone else in the room knew you were lying and that it simply did not matter. All this was exactly the sort of show of dominance that America needed to get back on track. The strange thing was that while Kavanaugh, the Kavanaugh nomination really was almost derailed by the initial credible accusation of sexual assault, his confirmation only became more certain as more details and context were reported about the incident. This was decidedly not because any of these details were, any, were in any sense exculpatory but because they should have constituted a much broader indictment. A large part of the desperation that members of the conservative intellectual class mobilized in order to get to yes with Kavanaugh was because the case against him almost immediately morphed from one individual accusation of assault to a broad and very well-supported indictment of their entire class. What was revealed was not that Kavanaugh, the man, was individually monstrous, but that he was a product of a monstrous milieu. The case against Kavanaugh was the case against the culture of Georgetown Prep, of fraternities at elite, at elite colleges, of the entire social world that produced <coughs> the entire conservative elite. So the more we learned about its horrors, the more urgent it became to find Kavanaugh innocent and to join him in safeguarding the sacrosanct life chances and career achievements to what he was and they were entitled. That's why no one told Trump to ditch him and replace him with some ideologically identical federal society goon who hadn't been credibly accused of sexual assault. It's also why Senator Lindsey Graham's red-faced outburst at the confirmation hearings made sure to paint Kavanaugh as the victim of a historic injustice, goading him into further self-pity. Graham questioned, would you say that you've been through hell? Kavanaugh. I, I've been through hell and then some. 
What made all this stuff of Dante and hyperbole was the simple self-evident truth that Kavanaugh was a good kid. Good kids are determined to be good, not according to their actions, which are frequently quite bad, but by their standing. On this status-driven reckoning of the natural order of things, the worst thing imaginable is for a good kid to be denied future opportunities to wield power. And I think this is the answer to this ridiculous question. Are white men the new discriminated class? Oh, me too. <laughs> Ten. Right. Well, yeah. Venezuela was the richest nation in South America, and then it went socialist. Hugo Chavez and Maduro promised social and economic reform, but, but they mismanaged the economy. Chavez printed money, more money, causing massive inflation. Democratic socialism has fa failed in Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, El Salvador, Chile, Nicaragua, Uruguay, Cuba. It has failed all over the world. Yeah. In Venezuela, the inflation, inflation rate reached one million percent. One million, I just read it the other day. One million? One million percent. It's ridiculous. One million percent. Uh, George McGovern ran for president in 1972 under a platform similar to the Democratic, the current Democrats, the, the Democrats, Green New, New Deal. He lost 49 states. The Green New Deal plan is to have 100% renewable energy within the next 10 years. Uh, the, the wind and solar energy would cost the U.S. about $2 trillion. Every year it would cost a tr trillion dollars. The, uh, the, the, the capitalist South Korea and West German countries has done much better than the socialist North Korea East, and East German, and German countries. The, the socialist worldview is taught in public schools and American universities. Yeah. Millennials are okay with this, this uh, uh, Green New Deal because they were taught this nonsense in public schools. The, the media will trumpet this false ideology because they went to the same liberal universities as, as these other Americans. In the 20th century, over 100 million people were murdered under the socialist countries of Russia, China, Nazi Germany, and Cambodia. Under the capitalist Trump administration, the economy is booming. Uh, the, 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 uh, The, the employment for blacks and Latinos and women, women is, is at an all-time high, and, and, and the stock market is up 42 percent. We should vote the Republican. That's my opinion. <laughs> hey. 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 All right. Let's give our uh, rebutter our attention, please. David, when you're ready. In my opinion, <coughs> unions only exist to pull this country more and more into socialism. That's a good thing. Uh, <coughs> I don't believe that unions have ever really done uh, the American cause any good whatsoever. And that is my opinion. All right, next. Next. He doesn't have any case for right. the opinion, but it's my opinion. All of yeah, the opinion. No reason for it. All right. <laughs> Five minutes. I won't supply your reason. Well, first of all, I believe that labor unions have a Let's country. give our speaker attention, please. Okay. Yeah. I believe That's that the labor unions, in fact, have done Charlie. an awful lot of good. It's because of labor unions that we have an A on a day. It's because of labor unions that child labor was eliminated. 
because of labor unions, that workers were, were treated more fairly. I think that the real answer can be described and what happened at Warm Springs, Georgia in 1945 after President Roosevelt died. A reporter went down there to cover the, 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 the president's death and he was picked up by a cab driver and he, the reporter was curious to know what the reaction of ordinary Americans was. And he was got to talking with the cab driver who said to him that before he had worked before becoming a cab driver, he had worked in a factory in Tennessee. And that they weren't given sick time off when they got sick. They had to work seven days a week. And, and as the, uh, this all changed when Franklin Roosevelt became president and the New Deal reforms came in. The cab driver said before Roosevelt we were treated like animals. After Franklin Roosevelt we were treated like human beings. And I think that's the real good that labor unions have done. The Taft-Hartley law was an attempt to roll back the clock. And it also made it, made it possible for states to pass right to work laws. And finally, I would say the following. There was a hearing uh, in the Senate, which John L. Lewis, the leader of the United Mine Workers, was testifying. And the uh, committee members were discussing the issue of mine safety. And they asked Lewis whether the, the mine workers would be interested in taking over the investigations and enforcement into uh, mine safety. And Lewis said, as only he could, that the United Mine Workers would be happy to take over the issue of mine safety as soon as Congress does something about Bob Taft's slave statue. Taft was sitting right there. He nearly hit the ceiling. He was mad. <laughs> and, well, that's pretty much about it. Uh, Lewis made it plain that he wanted the statute repealed. Thank you. All right. Well, even with the snow, we wanted to come up here to hear the topic. And um, the thing that does confuse me about the subject is human nature. Okay, decades ago, when I was much younger, I went into business with someone who was um, had connections and was persuasive. And it turned out he was a sociopath. Okay, it lasted about six months, and then I had to walk away from it. And the thing is, how does any organization protect us from the sociopaths, from the people that exist in the world who aren't nice? Okay, um, I find that, you know, the people who are at the top are not nice, okay? And if we have an organization to get rid of the not nice people at the top, how do we prevent the not nice people from rising to the top, okay? Um, I really don't know how to answer that one. I know that you know, we need unions to protect ourselves, to organize ourselves, but how do we protect ourselves from human nature? Okay, thank you. Uh, you guys are all boogers. Yeah. I've often, myself too, have questioned the validity of unions and the validity of the capital markets themselves. I'm going to share with you a brief story on unionization on my own kitchen table when I was in about seventh grade. My father owned a lumberyard. Well, not owned, but managed a lumberyard and was one of the top guys there. My mother was a school teacher. At the same time my mother went on strike for better wages and benefits, my father was facing an election with bringing in the Teamsters Union into his workplace. And here is their seventh grade son reading 
the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> At the time, I never, my father supported the teacher strike, but he had trouble understanding why the workers that he had were so upset with him. Upon further reflection, maybe it's the fact that uh, he went from one to two shifts because he was so busy and the workers would start at eight in the morning and work until the work got done, but that was gonna be seven, eight, nine o'clock at night for a while, five days a week. And they were missing dinner and this other stuff and they weren't upset about the wages, but they were upset about, you know, the long hours and the working conditions and mandatory overtime. And he finally went to two shifts and hired a few more workers to, to keep the prosperity going. And then he promptly set up 401ks, profit sharing, and I think some other items that they knew about to give him a better deal. But the only reason I think he really did that was he had to get his back against a wall and literally campaign to say, hey, we want the union out of here. But, you know, he had, he was hurt for a while, but he did do the right thing and became one of the best places to work at in the town he was located in. My mother, too, also had success because the union against the school district at the time, there was some problems with the union contract and there were some people in, in the school board who were wanted to cut back funding and some other things, so they had to go on strike to get some decent deals. Where I come into the deal is this. I was firmly convinced of the power of unions, the power of negotiation, but at the same time, I couldn't figure out why uh, so many of the communist countries, you know, that everything failed. Well, round about high school, I started reading Adam Smith, the uh, guy who was the architect of our, called the Wealth of Nations. I too became a very virulent capitalist. And around 1980, when the uh, program The Age of Uncertainty came out, around on, on, on national, on the on WTDW11 and the PBS network, I watched it. Recently, I've been watching capitalism grow and thrive around the world in the mid-90s and certainly gained quite a bit of, of, of ammunition around the world. If you look at countries like uh, New Zealand, uh, not, uh, Chile, for example, and some of the former communist countries, they adopted capitalism as a widespread way to get prosperous again. The problem now is, is that uh, like that was happening during Adam Smith's time, particularly with the East Indian East Indian Company, East India Company, that was one of the large corporations and its own private armies and private script and government. Corporations had too much power. Now, this is not the first time we have faced this problem. We all know about the 1890 strike, but it went on for years. I mean, the unions and the workers so much so that. If many of you ever remember or know about it, that Walt, there was an actual bombing on Wall Street in front of the big banks right around uh, the 1920s, I think it was 1923 that it happened. So it's nothing new. When finally got wages rising, I believe is when Ford paid his workers enough so they could buy a car, and he was trying to cut down on turnover at his plant. He paid his work. Huh? Because it was terrible. Well, the thing is, is that uh, he paid the workers enough to keep their jobs at the assembly line, and they were able to finally afford the car that he did, and the rest of the country started following in his, in his pursuit. Oh, shit. Now, unions did do a good job of getting weight because the weekend, the eight-hour day, and frankly, I'm very glad they did. Over time, there's a lot that we need to have unions credit for, but... The complete abolition of the capitalist system and its ways that has provided prosperity around the world is absolute what I consider male bovine fecal matter, if you want to be polite about it. You see, it takes an entrepreneur, a businessman, to come up with an idea. And yes, a lot of them are sons of bitches because it takes a lot of torso to get up there and 
get the markets and do the selling and then you have to hire the workers and get everybody else going. What we should be really celebrating is that uh, we're able now to do business. And if there's something, if you don't understand, there's a lot more cooperation in most businesses that you can see. I happen to know about the consumer electronics industry because I sell it on Amazon and eBay. If you look at the, uh, there is a system of underlying regulations that's called the RFCs or requests for something. And there's a whole bit of infrastructure that guides the internet together that's been done through mutual cooperation amongst the world. The United States set the standards and every year they meet to set those standards just to keep the internet interoperable between governments and areas like that. Your computer system, you know, you have the high definition multimedia interface or HDMI. That's usually done through a committee of some kind of standards for the industry so that their devices are interoperable. Um, and if a company, you know, there's also other areas of cooperation. There's a lot of areas of competition too, you know, who can come up with a better LED TV? Who can come up with the next device? And there's a lot more competition and, uh, as Schumpeter calls, creative destruction in that same space uh, versus for every really successful startup, there's maybe about 100, 150 plus companies that have tried and have failed. I am not against capitalism. I am against worker exploitation and corporate welfare in general. Thank you. I don't know where to begin with all this. Oh, Jonathan, you going up there? Or... I'm going up there. You want to go, Charlie? Okay. You can go, Charlie. Huh? You want to go first? Oh, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, this van is your land, according to you. Slim, Slim Brundage, the founder of the College of Complex, has once said this famous quote, uh, maybe socialism is a horrible thing. Some of the things I heard about it are almost as bad as things I've seen in Chicago jails. So, uh, you know, it depends on what uh, end of the propaganda you're on, your interpretation of these things. In 2007-2008, there is $15 trillion in waste, fraud, and abuse in the economic global collapse. So uh, we, in fact, do live in a socialist country. Uh, taxpayers bailed out the failure of the system. Uh, we, we have in this country socialism for the risk, risk and privatization for the benefits of the ruling class. Uh, the system didn't fail or succeed on its own accord. It required a bailout. We remember that. We the people have a long memory, uh, despite the propaganda avalanche put on us by corporate airwaves and corporate print waves every single second of our lives. Uh, it required a safety net. It required what is known throughout the world as socialism. So uh, each day that they tell you that it's all about honesty and hard work, and that's what makes up capitalism. Um, we commonly call that at the dinner table in working class and middle class communities, uh, excuse my language for a family restaurant saying this, bullshit. So that's what that is. You think you mean male bovine fecal matter, right? In your interpretation of what I'm saying right now, correct. <laughs> and I respect your interpretation because at least we're not throwing bombs at each other. So respectfully, whatever you want to put into your exercise of self-delusion. Um, when the search for work in a cold world is endless, be relentless. In the face of bosses, phony, friendly smiles, we call you. We'll call you. When the hunger and fatigue in an oligarchy is constant, be defiant. In a race of orbits, not miles, we the peeps can't lose. When the stress and confusion obstructing our movement is a trap door, be a brainstorm. When aching feet are tired, paying double our dues. Join with brothers and sisters, don't doubt love's with us, so the grind can't stop our free minds. Don't wait for the time, the hour is us, we choose. We know what's happening, all of this is not real. Just made up to make us forget our rights to appeal. 
It exists to make memory fade, then the devil unleashes his wheels, and the devil moves in for the kill, and then the system steals. This is we the peeps disapproval seal. This is we the peeps disapproval seal. When's it enough? When will it end? We know some systems up to something again. When's it enough? When will it end? We know empires up to something again. On this uh, May Day of this year, uh, in Chicago especially, but all over the world, uh, we realize that the reason why we the people of planet Earth choose systems that actually acknowledge that poverty is intolerable, that oppression is intolerable, that wage slavery is intolerable, is because socialism did win. Socialism won in the hearts and minds of we the people of planet Earth. What's in CEOs, boardrooms, and governments, and fossil fuel industry uh, heads and governments is irrelevant. That's less than 0.001% of the planet's population. So we are on a socialist planet, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, join us. Power to the people. Next, please. Next. <laughs> Oh, Jonathan, is this yours? Jonathan? Yeah, it's yours. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Ellen Corley, and uh, thanks, Jonathan. That was a wonderful uh, setup. And um, I want to read this book on Slim Bundridge. That's part of why I want to give a talk on uh, Bug House Square Day, uh, the, the day, um, you know, when the College of Complexes. I've been reading up on it a little bit that uh, the international, the IWW was the most popular part of the <clears throat> the Bug House Square, you know, tradition of getting on the soapbox and really arguing, you know, the people's point of view uh, in the 20s and 30s. Then uh, after World War II and the Cold War, there was a systematic suppression of of anarchism and socialism. That's the issue that I still want to uh, to research, investigate, escalate, uh, make public. Um, I think the covert suppression of, by the Red Squad uh, working with the police, uh, it's, it's a story that we know is going on. Um, I work with the Alliance Against Racist Political Repression uh, learning, you know, it goes back 45 years how to organize um, against police crime, against, they say one third of the people in prison were falsely imprisoned. Uh, it started with this fake drug war. Uh, you know, basically the drug war was invented so that we, you know, the, the powers that be, uh, they're really fascist powers, can bring opium and from Vietnam, that's why we had the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, it occurred to me today, given this, you know, the fact that I'm going to do a free speech forum. You know, really, the issue is war or peace. You know, and really, the corporation. I I was believed in entrepreneurship. I believed in Adam Smith and. But uh, when I came to Chicago, it always seemed kind of Russia-like to me, but realized that this is a machine organized from the top, totalitarian way, you know, it's a police state, and uh, it, it is not bottom-up entrepreneurial business in the Adam Smith sense of the word. Because even Adam Smith said, you know, um, he started it with a theory of moral sentiments that there's got to be morality in order to have you know supply and demand and free market and all that um, but without that we've got mercantilism we've got feudalism we've got um, you know it's the rare situation that can rise above uh, thank you for your speech. So I really am inspired. I, I want to join the Wobblies now. I, it, it appeals to me in that I uh, I didn't know it was even around still, but I think it's great that it came back. I uh, 
And it is for the people. It sounds like a real grassroots organization. Sounds like, um, you know, the, like so many things I tried to run for office uh, seem like they're just almost a propaganda game. You know, they really don't want you to run for alderman. You really, a lot of things, um, even the socialist conference I went to, it's more talking about, you know, uh, or, you know, macro, economics, Marx. You find yourself in arguments, you know, with people. And uh, I think socialism as an ideal and anarchism, it really is kind of an ideal, a family. It, it really is, I studied in business, what works, right, is cooperation. Competition actually just doesn't work that well. Um, you know, and you, you can kind of see it in hindsight from your own experience, uh, intuitively. But, you know, the, the main thing is you know, peace, war and peace. You know, why do we have war? What do we, uh, you know, when this, when Trump came along or the, even the, you know, the Iraq war, I mean, it really, what, it starts to all make a lot of sense if you recognize that these were false flag terrorist attacks, 9-11, you know, the Gulf of Tonkin, the, you know, all the wars were started, it's a racket, you know, as Smedley Butler said. He had fought in wars, he said he, you know, went all over the world, decorated general to discover that he was doing it, you know, for profit. We now, we do know who they were, the DuPonts, the, Rothschild, sorry, the, you know, Morgans, the Bushes, the Harrimans, the, the King, of, you know, of England, um, Alan Dulles, you know, they, it's, we name them, we know who did it, Cheney, Rumsfeld, um, you know, the best people, uh, the ones of moral, there are good people and bad people, people like David Ray Griffith, and, um, you know, we've, they, they've given us the materials, but these materials are systematically suppressed. And you just have to dig them up and, um, but I, somehow I want to come up with the right to the truth. That, you know, we are censored, there is misinformation, it is state-sponsored propaganda, and um, we had laws against it, they threw them out. They say now that we're in a, you know, we've, been attacked by ourselves. We're in a state of war. We put in the Patriot Act and no more uh, constitutional protections, no more free speech, no more um, privacy. You know, they have the right to listen to us over our computers, our cell phones, measure everything we say. Uh, the gang database went from 300 to hundreds of thousands, and then they you dispute it and they say, okay, it went away. Oh, no, it didn't. Uh, it's just like the Stasi police state, and um, but yeah, how to stop it? That's the challenge. Uh, it's but it does have to be done one at a time. But we've got to stop the supply. These guys, this one percent, are are evil, feudalistic kings, shadow government. They must be stopped. That's all. Thank you. All right, next, please. Get up there, Charlie. All right, let's uh, thank Kelsey and the other wives. Very nice presentation. I've got a lot to cover here. All right, let's thank our speakers. Thank you very much. That was a nice overview of the Wobblies. I'll try to fill in the gaps here. In 1935, they passed the Wagner Act, which made it possible to organize unions. And employers had to recognize unions if they took a vote as representing the employees and engaged in what is known as collective bargaining. 1938, they passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, talked about the eight hour day and uh, certain things like wage theft, child labor. In uh, 48, after the war, a certain amount of prosperity, Republicans were able to pass through the Taft Hartley Act, which basically allowed was a kind of a check on unions. Uh, but now, the, well, the Wobblies play in all this. Here are the three wings of the organized labor movement in the United States. 
You have the AFL, which are trades and crafts, the CIO, which were unskilled workers, Congress of Industrial Organizations, and the Wobblies, which came along with their own approach. They do believe in a type of socialism worldwide. They had worldwide things. They didn't go along for traditional bargaining and contract negotiations. Believed in worker solidarity. Uh, there still is a dispute. As a matter of fact, there was a, there was a labor educators conference on a year or so ago, and one of the major things was the, the current union thinking is the union wobblies want solidarity solidarity among a, a group worker grouping people are working together. It's called the commonality of interest, as opposed to other unions where you got a guy like me where people come and you render a service. And they pay a fee and we provide a service. And then some of the thinking is that's why the the movement, the wobblies really had the right approach and that there's worker solidarity as opposed to this service concept. Now the one thing that happened is is that the labor laws have gotten very complex. The employers, you generally hire lawyers. Any personalist in a company is a lawyer. So yes, the labor laws have gotten more complex and in order to engage in any of these disputes, you're going to need to have some background in labor law. Um, the Wobblies also pioneered. Here's, this is some other things that the Wobblies did that got them in real trouble. One, they were targeted. You asked why they didn't grow. They were targeted. The leaders were targeted for murder. And then some of them skipped the country. I believe you me, when they target the leaders of a union, and I've lived through that, uh, it can be very difficult to keep your officer structure once you're targeted. We were not appointing people to official positions. They had targeted my union at one time, anyone that was married and had a mortgage and kids. We weren't doing it because the chances of getting fired were relatively high. A lot of people quit the union. I went to I went to a grievance and arbitration, and I won the case so soundly that it became it's, it was used last week in case law for the perfect example of not how to bother. Don't don't pick on a union official knows what he's doing because I came away with everything that I wanted out of that. They said you don't do this. The other day, the lobbies were accused it was organizing against the employer is called criminal syndicalism. It's called, you're engaged in restraint to trade. It was against the law before the Wagner Act. So any, any wobblies, and all wobblies also went one step further when I talk about innovative things, they believed in sabotage. And one thing to get the employer, like here, you didn't get the, you just rot a bad employer, guess what, some accident might happen. Things break down. Stuff like this, machinery and factories break down. Um, the, uh, they also did an engage in pioneered such things as a sit-down strike. Instead of leaving the plant so that they could hire replacement workers, they uh, would sit down and take control, like here, if you controlled the restaurant, and said, we're not leaving, we, it's our restaurant now. So obviously, they were targeted uh, in that regard. Very, why they organized it, primarily also organized Unions are organized by industries, and they primarily organize the lumber, lumbering industries, agriculture, which aren't the biggest industries these days, but which might mean uh, why they're, like, like my union that I'm affiliated with, we, we, we started to organize aerospace workers in the 50s. So we grew, because aerospace industries grew. You know. It was like, a, you know, that was our ploy. Uh, now anybody, somebody in there said, oh, I don't like unions, I don't want unions. That is, that is the height, height of illogic. When you have a union, it changes your status as an employee by an infinite degree because you are no longer employed at will. In order to be terminated, the employee, you have a, now you have a legal basis for submitting an appeal 
if they should fire you or mistreat you in any fashion, without it, you're lost. I guarantee you, you have no appeal rights. If a guy comes along and says, uh, President, Ed, you're fired, I'm hiring my cousin. Nothing you can do about it if you don't have a union. If you got a union, he's not going to be allowed to do that. It's a difference of light and day. Anybody who doesn't want the legal status that a union, even the worst union, confers a whole new world is open to you in terms of the legal status that you have. That anybody who does not do anything you can to get a union organized and get a change in that status. Every union contract spells out employer rights and employee rights, which you never have in the private sector. And you think your industry, the Communist Manifesto, I've been, come on, I've been studying labor law for 35 years. I've never been assigned to read the Communist Manifesto. I read it on my As own. As a union <laughs> book. But you think the day it is. You think the electronics industry, now this is a good example, besides the electronics industry is an example of the positive thing that was good. These were the factories where they had nets because the employees were committing suicide. You cannot get into, it, it, you know, you can, no one can get into an electronics factory, a news reporter or anybody. They'll say, they'll say are you employed here or not? No, no, you're lucky if you could talk to the employees. You have to find them someplace out of work. And that's the example you give as a wonderful example of capitalist industry. And the that they got to hide and the what they're doing, that their employees, they won't allow you to talk to any, won't let any inspectors in there. Nobody gets in there. There's hard to get photos of what goes on in these places. And that's the example you give of successful capitalism. And prices of televisions have gone down drastically. Join the wobblies. Prices of consumer goods have gone down okay. drastically. Okay, he's dumb, crazy. He thinks the Communist Manifesto is a labor, labor handbook? Labor law? You know, I never say, said that. Come on. No, it's a fact you didn't. All right. All right, Andy. Government? Yeah. All right, all right, Andy, we got some time. Let's have speakers still here. Yeah. Um, a few observations. Uh, somebody, there's a term somebody coined a few years ago to describe uh, when somebody is feeding you a, a, a line that's not really correct. Sometimes it's called bullshit. Well, uh, this other person said, it's a giant load of cribs. That's short for criminally insane bullshit. We're not talking about baby cribs here. They say, that's a giant load of cribs, and I won't have it in my presence. Well, we heard some very large loads of cribs unloaded at this microphone tonight. The idea that unions have not been the major driving force for better working conditions, better hours, better wages, and all improvements in living conditions driven by unions. The idea that unions haven't been that driving force, that's a giant load of cribs. The idea that unregulated capitalism with benevolent corporate owners yeah. treating their non-union workers to a fair share of the profits, a fair share of their labor, that's another giant load of cribs. The idea that we can go on with business as usual and pass a livable environment onto our kids and grandkids without, without major changes very, very fast. It's another load of cribs. And anybody who's an environmentalist? The idea, the idea that collective bargaining was not a major driving force for the increase in the middle class in this country after World War II is another load of cribs. It's not debatable in any shape or form. It's like debating whether the earth is flat or round. The Flat Earth England and Society still has about 2,000 members, but they're increasingly having problems showing uh, contrasting evidence when people show up with pictures of the Earth from the space shuttle. 
But you still have people. There's people in certain countries that believe that 72 virgins are waiting for them in heaven after they uh, kill some infidels. These are religious beliefs that have no basis in reality. And they, these beliefs are not just the, confined to the major religions. Bertrand Russell, back about uh, 80 years ago, Bertrand Russell said, if you could get 100 religious leaders all in uh, one room, 100 of the major religions, they all have a different viewpoint of their, whose way is right. He was a mathematician. He said, I can tell you that one of you may have the right word of God, but I can also tell you that 99 of you are dead wrong. And he said, I'm reserving judgment because I don't know which one of you has the right way. I'm not an atheist. I'm an agnostic. That's Russell. He wrote a book called Why I'm Not a Christian in 1910. Tim mentioned factories with nets to keep their employees from jumping out the That's window Charlie and committing Charlie suicide. That's capitalism at its finest. Unregulated capitalism. You treat the workers like human machines. It's called mercantilism, not capitalism. Well, uh, it's one of the same, basically. That's not quite We have not quite yet. the idea that protests don't matter is being you talk about various workers' protests, various kinds of protests all over the planet. Well, right now, we're seeing one of the most effective nonviolent protests in the history of the human race. And that is with the Fridays for the Future, the global climate strike from schools all over the world. It's spread to seven continents now. Schools on every continent have groups of sometimes tens of thousands of workers in certain workers, yeah, students, uh, under high school age, a lot of them, uh, striking every Friday. And it, how many people have seen pictures of the city of London being shut down by climate strikers over the last week or two? Yeah. Is everybody familiar with that? Yes, I am. Tim is. The concept trade. of striking, uh, nonviolent protest, is one of the most effective ways to disrupt business as usual. They're saying, well, why don't you write a letter to the Prime Minister? Well, that doesn't disrupt anything. Things don't get better until a massive amount of people say, this is no longer acceptable. In around 1965, somewhere thereabouts, the mass of American people all over the country, and especially in the South, said, it's no longer acceptable to see people hanging in trees from nooses. We don't want to see that anymore. We'll prosecute anybody that contributes to it. Uh, just a few years ago, we had restaurants that looked like opium dens. The cigarette smoke was so dense. But the public reached critical mass and laws were passed recognizing that 99% of all children that go to emergency room hospitals with asthma attacks they come from a family with a smoker. Not true. That is true, Charlie. Yeah, absolutely not true. Well, you got to pull absolutely it out and air it out, Charlie. Absolutely not true. Okay. Uh, the last you thing I'll say. It. It's not true. I want to thank our speaker for giving a very articulate presentation about uh, the concept of what workers' rights can do versus not protesting, not getting involved. Whoops. And thank you for your talk tonight, and uh, you have the last word. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for uh, for having me here tonight. Um, I didn't really uh, I didn't realize that I was going to have closing statements, so I hadn't really prepared any, but. Um, I really appreciate you uh, having me here. I appreciate uh, the uh, the support, even if uh, even if we disagree. Um, I appreciate. Yeah, uh, you don't have to have a closing prepared statement. You can rebut any, what anybody said or add to it. And from if, if they gave any more ideas throughout the talk, just off the cuff. I, I'm sure I did have more ideas, but I also had a gin and soda. <laughs> so.
<laughs> they may not be the most articulate ar ideas. Ideas. Um, but yeah, so so thank you so much, uh, and uh, I hope I can come back at some point. We will. Yeah. We'd love to have you come back. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Close us out, Andy. Okay. Cute shirt, too. Thanks. Uh, that's it for this Saturday night for the College of Complexes, everybody. Hope to see you all next week, and we are adjourned. Oh, Tim? No, I'll talk.